welcome everyone to uh, another episode of the Future of Architecture, where today we'll be talking to Dr. Sachabe Mape, and uh, we're going to be talking about alternative realities and decoloniality. Now, Dr. Sachabe Mape has uh, a very uh, highly accoladed and esteemed career, uh, and the research she's done will be the focus of our talk today. So Dr. Mape, I'm not going to go on too much about you because I think you'll be able to best uh, give us an introduction to yourself much better than I would be able to. So Dr. Maka, please uh, take it over from here. Uh, tell us a little oh, bit about oh. yourself. <clears throat> All right, thank you for the invite. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and those who will see the recorded um, video. Um, my name is Chaba Maape. Um, I am uh, a lecturer at Wits University. Um, I was born in a small town in the Northern Cape of province of South Africa called um, Kuruman, um, where I just also happened to um, uh, focus um, my research attention, uh, primarily because uh, it's a place uh, that has a lot of um, research on the origins of humanity. And so um, a lot of these sites are um, archaeological sites, and they also uh, happen to be uh, ritual sites. And so a lot of my work has to do with uh, the origins of humanity um, and the way in which human beings inhabit the world. And that's where my work as an architect comes in, is uh, what can that teach us about how we can inhabit the world? So, yeah, that's really me in a, in a nutshell. Um, I'm a husband and a father of two children. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's me. Thank you, Dr. Mape. I think you are very humble in your approach because you've actually uh, spoken in, on various platforms. You've shared a lot of your views of the world and at the same time, while balancing uh, having a family. And I think that is very admirable and very noble. So, Dr. Mape, <laughs> one of the new things you've also done, apart from everything else you're doing, you also recently established uh, architecture, a parallel design pr uh, practice. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, architecture? Okay, yeah, so architecture is uh, it's uh, a way in which uh, I'm trying to use um, the research that I've been engaging in um, to practically um, imagine an alternative architecture practice. Um, the way in which uh, some of my lectures that I've done that you would know about, I've been talking about alternative architecture schools. And so, you know, I realize that um, often people only focus on um, the actual designing of buildings and trying to change and imagine alternative types of buildings that respond to our current human condition. Um, but then I realized very quickly being an academic that uh, the tools that we use in order to produce these buildings are actually things that need to be questioned. So, for example, the tool of the architecture school needs to be questioned. And if you think about it, the architecture school is uh, not a universal phenomenon in the sense that it's something that can also um, be uh, scrutinized and uh, taken through uh, uh, revised design process, just like what uh, happened at the Bauhaus school with Walter Gropius. He came up with a whole new kind of architecture school. So that produced a lot of influence in terms of the modern world that we live in today. And therefore, why can we not uh, rethink, redesign the architecture school, um, just like how we are constantly redesigning buildings? and thinking about buildings using design thinking. So why can't we use design thinking to think about architecture schools? And in the same way, I realized that, well, actually, well, why not take this thought even further and think, how can we redesign architecture practices? And uh, just like in design, we go through a process of iteration. We uh, go through a process of prototyping, um, you know, um, why, why are we not uh, doing that with architecture practices? Because surely if we do that with architecture practices, we will um, hopefully design different kinds of buildings because they're coming from a different type of tool. And therefore, I decided to create um, uh, architecture as exactly that, as an experimental practice where 
you know, we're thinking about an alternative way of uh, practicing architecture, all the way to thinking about, uh, and I like saying this to my students, that, you know, I even imagine the kind of people who work in architecture, even though right now it's just myself. Um, I imagine the future people who will work in architecture, and I even think about their clothes. I think about their hairstyles. I think about uh, the kind of music they listen to. You know, I think about the kind of artworks that are on the walls in the practice, uh, the food that they eat, the discussions that we have. I imagine it just like you imagine a building before you build it, you know, uh, which I, I guess that's kind of what an entrepreneur does as well. But, you know, the aim really here is uh, to use design thinking to craft a new reality, to craft a new world. Uh, as far as the practice is concerned. And that's really what the experiment of Afrotech is all about. <clears throat> so Dr. Mape, on what you just mentioned now, I think that is ideally what all schools of architecture at this moment in time should be going after, particularly through the uh, social political events and even natural events that have occurred. Everybody should be re redefining and rethinking what architecture should be because we've had a lot of change with this technological or with its social, even political in the last few years. And if we are really holding on to models which have been done um, decades ago, I think mm. we would be become irrelevant very quickly, um, especially with the new changes that have occurred. And I think what you're talking about is very exciting because there definitely should be more experimental architectural practices. Um, but I think there would be a, a number of people that are also against this uh, experimental way and, and, and this newness for a number of reasons. Um, I've discussed in, in prior sessions how the architectural industry uh, or the AEC industry is generally hesitant to change. Uh, and mm. a lot of people feel uh, in our field that investigating alternative approaches, particularly if it's decolonial, um, or it's almost as though it's an attack on architectural discourse. So some say mm. that that is a political move. Some say that it's identity politics. What then would be your take on alternative reality, specifically uh, looking at decoloniality? Because what I imagine is what you are talking about, you're looking at a, at a local version of architecture as opposed to what we've been doing all these years. And I'd say that would be decolonial. So what is your take on decoloniality? <clears throat> OK, so let me maybe just step back a little bit. So where all of this stuff comes from is the caves that I used to visit and spent many, many hours. You know, I realized that um, rituals, what people talk about when they talk about rituals, they are ways in which uh, society or humanity from a very long time ago has learned how to craft realities which are appropriate to respond to the kind of situation that they're in, right? So. Mm. I realized that, um, say for instance, somebody has to move transition uh, from being a young boy to a man, or from being an ordinary member of society to being the chief. They now have to um, inhabit a different kind of reality. And so in order for you to inhabit a different kind of reality, you need to be weaned away from your previous reality. You have to be taken away from it. So you have to take someone through a process of breaking their reality, first of all. You break the, uh, the, the, the underlining uh, understanding that they have of themselves relative to society or to the world. And so there's a breaking down process. And usually in the ritual process, you break down. And then there's the liminal phase. There, you know, Victor Turner talks about liminal beings, which are people who are neither between and who are between and betwixt people who are in the middle part of this process of change and transformation. And then there's eventually going into this new paradigm. Okay, so this is uh, the ritual spaces that I've been researching. They are actually um, created to help break someone's reality. And it's uh, by inducing a lot of emotions and many things, you know. So for example, if they take you to this deep dark cave, they take you to that deep dark cave so that they can uh, inundate you with uh, experiences that unhinge you from your, uh, you know, your conditioning thus far, your conditioning being I am a young man or a young woman. And they take you into this cave, which they've told you your whole life is a frightening place and there's a 
mythical snake there and whatever, and they take you to this very place. And through this process and the darkness of the cave and all of these things, they break the old conditioning. And this happens everywhere. In army, it happens. In political circles, it happens. In, uh, you know, cults, all kinds of situations in society where people want to reorientate you or reframe reality. They take you through these processes. And then ultimately, they reestablish a new kind of paradigm. Now, this is something that happens all over the world. Many people have written about it. So I realized from all of this that actually reality is plastic. Your brain and the way in which it engages the world, there's a kind of plasticity. And there's a very specific process that you can take human beings through in order to bring about a new kind of reality. <clears throat> and therefore, um, the methodology that I'm using when I talk about parallel worlds and trying to bring about these parallel worlds and that sort of thing is in itself drawn out of African worldviews and African knowledge systems. So this whole thing I've been explaining is a knowledge system. So already the premise that I'm starting from comes from indigenous knowledge systems. It in itself is decolonized. So the moment you start talking about alternative realities, alternative paradigms, that's antithetical to the notion that the world is only one fixed reality, which is actually just a hegemonic, dominant Western reality thus far. But people want to make us think that the world is just this one fixed reality. And my job is to say, how do we break that hegemonic dominant reality so that we can begin talking about a pluriverse, plural, multiple realities or different avenues of realities, which are political, you know, you have to struggle, you have to fight. It's going to be a fight for us to bring about the reality that will ultimately win. So it is through this decolonial uh, or this um, indigenous knowledge systems that I'm actually trying to engage. So I'm questioning the notion of a fundamental objective reality. And that's my challenge towards the colonial project, which tried to make it seem as if there's one hegemonic reality that has been spread all across the world. Dr. Mafia, what an insightful um, and thought-provoking answer, particularly where you mentioned this idea of, of breaking your version of reality. And like you said, it happens uh, almost in a systematic way in yeah in a systematic way in a number of uh, places around the world. I think even in myself as a lecturer as well, when I'm taking students through this version of what do you think architecture was and what is architecture, you have to take them through the process. And then towards the end of the year, someone's like, "Wow, was that me that thought this is what architecture was at the beginning <laughs> of the end?" You exactly you realize, <laughs> you realize you don't really know anything as a student, and now your world is opening up to a new mode of thinking. And th that's the first portion I, I really appreciate in what you're saying. And particularly, like you mentioned, to, 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 to change roles in society, if you are either a boy becoming a man or whether you are a student becoming an architect, there's, there's a number mm. of, of ritual processes that follow. And, and that, that process, I think, is a very important one. And that's where you, you mentioned you've drawn um, on African, African traditional practices and looked at the processes uh, which mm. rituals have, have used to, to sort of frame these worldviews. And you mentioned mm. um, um, almost like a, a, a new production of knowledge, uh, new knowledge, modes of knowledge production. And uh, you also mentioned the term indigenous and, and that was quite a, an interesting take because I think generally the, the term indigenous peoples and the idea even of indigenous futurism at this moment in time, particularly because of many social uprisings like Black Lives Matter and a lot of so mm. what, what some people call a, a, a wokeness, um, it becomes mm. appealing, becomes appealing in design, especially to those people who are of color and who are mm. young. And, and even more so if you were a product of prior generations of oppression, or even if you're currently undergoing some exactly. sort of oppression. So, mm. but, but this term now that you mentioned indigenous peoples, which seems to, to group all uh, diverse identities together, what would you say in your opinion is a reasonable approach to addressing the issue of what does indigenous mean without being on either end of the spectrum, without grouping everybody together and without causing so-called factionality between people? Um, and, and what can we learn? Yeah. So look, I think, um, uh, you know, ultimately um, this process I've been talking about in uh, the communities I've been engaged with and these caves and all of this, 
the aim really to break someone's reality like that is to um, make them come to a real, it's a kind of like a spiritual process. It's to make them come to a realization uh, that, uh, you know, um, your little, very sort of um, self orientated sense of the world, uh, which is, uh, you know, you yourself are a colonizer. Me, myself, I'm a colonizer because we want to colonize our worlds in such a way that we have control and that we can delineate the mm -hmm. edges of everything, just like how that famous image of Cecil John Rhodes stretching over Africa with uh, a, a wire, a string to measure it. There's this desire that uh, humanity has to, um, you know, measure the world and control it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the notion of uh, indigenous, really for me, um, is uh, connected to actually something very universal, something very uh, cosmic. So, you know, my location on the planet and uh, my uh, traversing and understanding of my location in the planet uh, and my engagement with my particular eco niche, which is just something that happens to have arrived by virtue of the fact that the planet is getting different uh, solar radiation from the sun. And it's, you know, the sort of celestial movements of the planet, uh, uh, you know, create certain eco niches. So those eco niches, those local eco niches, through uh, an ongoing dialogue with those places, people have established a way of ultimately reaching a, this kind of pinnacle of truth, which is that the whole cosmos itself has rhythms. So you learn those rhythms through the songs that are sung in your corner of the solar radiated planet. But ultimately, what, the, what these indigenous knowledge practitioners are trying to lead you to is this notion or this sense of the ultimate rhythm of this cosmos. You see, so for me, indigenous knowledge systems are about you understanding this harmony or understanding this rhythm from your corner of the planet. But ultimately, when everyone from each corner of the planet, whether it's North America, whether it's India, whether it's whatever, when they listen to those rhythms within their local corner of the solar radiated planet, when they listen to those rhythms, it will ultimately lead them to a very universal understanding, which is that every single one of us in the planet in every eco niche is part of a wider cosmic rhythm. That's to me what indigenous knowledge systems are. It's not about our own little local knowledge for its own sake. It's actually connecting us to this bigger truth. Sure, Dr. Mafia, your explanation uh, even resonated with me on those rhythms, because uh, I think the way you've described it, generally what seems to be, and I, and I understand in politics, there, there seems to be a right and a left wing, and there's this in between which some people follow and then either on either end of the spectrum, none of them want to hear what this in between is. But what you've just mentioned now is that what I feel a lot of people have been doing have been, or even, even in our architectural courses, we're trying to almost create people in a generic sense, this one universal human being without mm -hmm. taking into account that the differences between us is not a means of division. If we mm -hmm. even look at our coat of arms, it's unity and diversity. It's South African coat of arms, by the way. It's unity and diversity. It's to be able to appreciate differences as a uniting factor, not as a, a, a mm. something that factionalizes us. Um, mm. So what you mentioned now is that we all are trying to ascribe to a universal truth, but there's many ways to get there. Um, particularly mm. in this, in, if you had to look at indigenous knowledge systems, it is so many or so varied and complex interpretations mm. of the truth but it is a truth that we are looking for. And, and, and mm. this idea that we're looking for the truth is what, what is um, uniting us. And I think that's quite an incredibly sophisticated um, and intellectual approach to looking at the situation. And um, I, I would believe and I, that, that, and I would hope that there are a lot of people working towards a similar um, notion of, of what indigenous knowledge systems are instead of it being as though it's, like you say, for its own sake, it's just sort of, yeah. well, there's people that exist in the world, let's kind of throw charity their way and listen to what they have to say, just because for whatever reason it is you want to. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I think particularly that was very insightful for me. And um, we, we mentioned a, a few words and I, I think that to some degree are, are high, hot topics and things that people don't necessarily want to talk about like indigenous knowledge and indigenous futurism and decoloniality and particularly in South Africa because we are trying to move away from uh, apartheid um, as well as prior colonialism. Mm. One pedagogy in that could be used in architectural um, education is uh, Paulo Freire's uh, pedagogy of the oppressed, or at least that's been an influencing factor um, from 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 what I hear in academic circles. Um, and he discusses the effects of um, colonialism and what it's had its effects that it's had on educational discourse, and also what a potential solution might be. Where he says that um, and where alternative reality should be developed to what is in the mainstream. So alternative reality is um, where world, where world denouncing colonial views is, is one of the focuses of the work that you've done over the last decade. And mm. so you have mentioned that in architecture, that's the work you're currently doing, you are trying to express this in, in your research that you've also done in Kurman. Um, what are the other insights that you've gathered that could help us radically change this pedagogical view we have? of how architectural education should be. Uh, what are some of the other golden nuggets of insight that you haven't shared yet with us that you could maybe elaborate a bit more on? Look, I think um, for me, really, there's just a, a simple uh, kind of task that uh, I'm interested in. And it's to just make people realize that they are inhabitants of planet Earth. And you know, it might sound like such an obvious thing, um, but if you really think about uh, the human condition, people don't want to face certain realities. Like for instance, the fact that we live in this uh, gigantic uh, cosmos, which uh, to a large degree, I was watching something the other day where this lady was saying that, you know, 97% of uh, our universe is black, black, what is it, dark matter, dark and matter. <laughs> we have no idea what it is. That's 90 something percent, right? Which is pretty much saying we have no clue what it is, what's going on, <laughs> right. you know, absolutely no clue. I mean, 90, if she said 30%, it would be something, right? But she's right. saying 90, she said something like 97%. Okay. <laughs> and I would imagine the little 3% that we do know, we don't really know much about, right? <laughs> right, right. So, so, so now what that firstly makes you recognize is that as a human being, you are confronted with this reality that you're in this situation, in this world, in this cosmos that has some kind of a logic, right? You right. know that uh, in a couple of months here in the global south, it's going to get warmer. And then you know that a few months later after that's going to get cold. So there's a logic. There's some right. kind of a rhythm. Right? Right. There's a rhythm I'm talking about. Now, many people don't want to concede with the fact that they have no idea. No idea. And they are not actually in control. Look at COVID, right? right. Now, the reason why I like using the example of Cecil John Rhodes with the string stretching over Africa is because they had this desire. And, you know, think about the term, the enlightenment. And sure. uh, to enlighten, they had this desire to bring light to the darkness. Right. Now we know that 97% of the universe is the darkness. <laughs> so I'm not sure how Cecil John Rhodes is going to get around that because it's quite a big project to try and colonize <laughs> this entire universe, right? So this, the situation is th that humanity cannot conquer the universe. And you see, to me, the, the symptom, you know, of the neurosis of trying to conquer, which is conquering all those who are as dark as the, the universe, all those who are part of the rhythms of the universe, you call them primitive, because you see them, you know, singing in harmony with the birds and the animals and the oceans. So you're like, oh my God, they are part of this universe. And now you want to like, you know, you want to catch them because when you catch them, you're catching the universe itself. And hopefully, you know, by doing that, you're going to be in some kind of control, mm -hmm. but it will never be, right? So mm -hmm. if we can 
just come to terms with that first and foremost by humbling ourselves. That's why if you look at my logo of architecture, it's this, uh, this, uh, this circle that has uh, this round uh, vortex and uh, a human being sitting down kneeling in front of this round vortex because they are basically saying, I surrender. But surrender could mean what? It could mean instead of you using concrete and cement, you're going to use natural materials. Right, surrender right, right. could mean instead of you, you know, uh, just wanting to pump lots of cold air through, uh, you know, air conditioning, you're going to use passive cooling. Right. That's I surrender. You see what I'm saying? And right. when somebody is now beginning to be conscious of that, it to me means that they're conscious of the fact that there are rules in this universe that we found here long before our species only became cognitively the way you and I are anatomically modern about 150,000 years ago or so. Now imagine all the other millions of years this planet has been here. And suddenly we come and we think that we know the rules of the game and, you know, screw this place. Who cares about the rules? We're going to do it our way. Do you know what I'm saying? I follow you. So I hear you. What I, what I'm hoping, and that's what indigenous knowledge uh, holders will say. They basically, they, their whole job is to take you, drag you by the hand, and you'll be kicking and screaming the whole way. They drag you by the hand to point you into the direction of witnessing the immensity and the complete mystery of the whole thing so that you can become a big boy now and <laughs> swallow the whole thing, big boy, swallow the whole thing, and come to terms with it, feel the pain and the fear and the yeah. trauma until you are humbled enough to say, okay, I concede, it's definitely bigger than me. You know, let me, uh, let me humble myself and let me engage with some passive cooling in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mabe, that, that was that's a very um, <laughs> humorous final line because in fact that that's been I think what human beings have been wrestling with it's, it's you're wrestling against environment but this the moment you begin to realize that you 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 that you are that you are humble and you humble yourself there's strength in that that's a position of strength as opposed to exactly. trying to dominate and conquer I'm actually going to bring up your your logo very quickly because um I think there's a lot of value in, 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 in us having a look at it together here while you are here. So, and you would be able to give us the best explanation, interpretation of your logo. Um, one second, I'm just getting my, sheet, my screen ready to share. Um, and I actually found this logo extremely insightful myself because you actually spoke about it at the SIA uh, transformation series, where you spoke about how the South African Institute of Architecture's logo is really based kind of like on colonial times and on a more Eurocentric Greek Roman sort of view with a column and <laughs> exactly. lion standing and I, it's, it's very strange. So please, please, um, please talk us through it. Yeah, so so this comes from uh, this, uh, I was in Durban when uh, I, f I did the first drawing of this and the day before I did the drawing um, it was a series of many drawings. I mean, I've been working on this for many years um, and I was uh, finally, like, uh, woke up at about 4 a.m. Uh, I felt I needed to go and pray. So I went into this uh, space, in this lounge, and I opened the curtain, and this uh, sky just appeared, this gigantic sky. And in that moment, I suddenly had this complete... Um, realization and i'm sure at that time uh, it was probably not even enough of a realization but this realization of the immensity and total total mystery of the cosmos that we live in it was so i won't use the word that i want to use frightening <laughs> in that moment you know and i yeah. basically fell on my knees and uh, all I could do was be in awe. That's all I could do because, I mean, what else can you do, really? Yeah. You know, because in that moment, you know, I, I, it's probably because I'd been thinking about it for so long, really. And in that moment, the realization just hit me. And so when I was down on my knees like that, it really made me recognize my position. You know, it, 
it it made me recognize my position in the hierarchy of things that there is something far 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 bigger than me and it's far more intelligent you know in fact my pathetic little breath that I'm breathing every single day comes from this cosmos that we're in and I have absolutely no clue <laughs> how that whole thing works. Nothing. You know, I am totally surrendered into this whole thing. So it's it was so powerful for me to arrive at that realization that, you know, we actually come into this planet, um, you know, these bare, bare bodied uh, ape-like beings and uh you know at some point uh, before you know 150,000 years ago maybe somewhere in the southern coast or wherever where we thought we were clever somehow before then we were part of the whole rhythm of the thing you know somewhere somewhere along the line and I think that the, 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 the sort of crescendo was the enlightenment where we were enlightened we then decided to say, you know, screw it. We can actually conquer this thing. And therefore we set sail and we went out and we conquered all the primitives. And therefore, uh, yeah, we're in the situation we're in today. But this logo, what it basically represents, because you can see that the movement of these, mm. they, those are actually like fish or whatever creatures those are, is unidirectional. Mm. They're going around in... Uh, uh, a, a cyclical process mm. and the person in order for them to be part of the rhythms there's no other way you can do it really but by humbling yourself because if you are so uh, full of uh, you know the, the egoistic idea that you can uh, reorientate the movement of this thing I mean can you really do that really can you reorientate the movement of the celestial bodies like the sun because the reason why, I mean, I was looking at a detailing a student of mine did the other day, uh, or they were investigating a detailing, and this was a detailing of a, a, a building somewhere in um, Britain, in the, in the UK. And the amount of insulation, I was just like, my God, these people have to insulate? <laughs> and it just showed me that, you know, it's, this, it's still that same spirit, you know, we are going to stay here, whether we have enough fur on our bodies or not. We're going to stay here. And so, therefore, we're going to drape our building in lots of fur so that we can survive in this very cold climate, you know. <laughs> really, you, that's what... Like you, you approach that. I never really thought of it in that way before. That's what you have to do when you live in extreme climates. And then, you know, Elon Musk, he wants to build a geodesic dome somewhere on Mars because, you know, in order for the homeostasis of the human being, the body to survive in such a, I mean, yeah. you should look at papers that people have written on how you insulate a rocket ship. And remember the thing about a rocket ship is not just that you're going to have uh, issues with a cold or whatever in space, it's the solar radiation from the yeah. sun. People get cancer yeah. from that, you see. And so that's my point is that our puny little bodies uh, you know, have this very small eco niche called Earth that we, uh, you know, are basically blessed with. It's grace that we've got this thing. And yet we want to act as if we can just go around conquering and changing the orientation of the movement of the celestial bodies through our insulation. You see, so that's the whole purpose behind this, <laughs> this logo. Dr. Mapi, I think, uh, as you mentioned, the celestial orbit and the bodies and the idea of humility when you realize the greatness, particularly the point where you say you come to a point of realization that, you know what, this is bigger than me. I'm a part of a system. I am not the system and everything, or I'm not the center of the system and everything revolves around me. Um, I think that's a, a very empowering as well as a humbling experience to go through. And I, I think... Right. In, in, in that moment, as you mentioned, if, if I had to just imagine this was you in the image and any one of us here on the floor realizing, you know what, this is a lot larger than me, but I'm also very, I'm part of this, this whole body, which means I, I have a role exactly. to play as well. Exactly. That's simultaneously humbling and empowering, exactly like yeah. you said. I love the way you put it. 
because it doesn't mean that we're just victims of the universe and oh now we yeah, yeah. go around <laughs> crying and whatever no right 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 it means that you get into the rhythm you start the, yes. that you start clapping because there's already a song that's playing before we got here right you know right, so right. just get in and start jamming <laughs> with the rest of it yeah that, that, you know? that exactly because you, you are now realizing your role in a larger system and you play with these or you move along with these rhythms and i think it's 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 and uh, especially um insightful take that you had on it and this logo sums it up very well and i think in fact this uh and i advise anyone who's watching this as well to go and watch the saya um, transformation series uh, particularly the first episode where dr Stjaba mape was on to listen to his um approach and his um take on on, on what he's discussed here but regarding how to transform um, and architectural body industry practice towards these ideas. I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Mape, very quickly. At the bottom, it says established in Abantupodia. Can you tell me a bit more about that as well? Aban established in Abantutopia. Oh, Abantutopia. Ab Abantu means humans, humanity, and obviously utopia. Yes. Uh, Abantutopia is, again, using the tools of design thinking, imagining of imagining this uh, world where we are all part of the rhythm, that's about utopia. It's this uh, ideal, uh, you know, utopian uh, condition where we are all in the song. Um, and I'm working my way backwards, you know. How can we move from here to there, to about utopia? It sounds like it was a state of mind and, and that's, at that moment when you were in that state of mind, that's when it was established. And I think it's excellent, uh, <laughs> Dr. Mafia. Um, Dr. Mafia, so that we mentioned about uh, Abantutopia, the, the question that is on from that now, um, and I think perhaps there's a, a lot of discussion at this moment in time, even in an Afrocentric worldview, what then in your opinion is the future of architecture? So yeah, they say that again, was there? So in, in your opinion, especially now that we've had a lot of Afrocentric ideas that are now in orbit with ourselves in Africa as well as the rest of the world. It's always been there, but now it's just been more, I'd say there's more acknowledgement that Africa has a lot to contribute to the rest of the world. What do you think, not just Africa, but every other continent as a whole, whether indigenous or so-called non-indigenous mm. or whatever that means, what do you think the future of architecture holds for us? Yeah, you see, I think, Right now, if you think about it, a lot of people and there's lots of grants that are going out for um, regenerative architecture. And you see this regenerative discussion to me, um, it's still quite technocratic and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I think the future is the fact that people are acknowledging plurality. And plurality really for me, again, I see someone wrote here, within the discourse of the decolonial movement, what is rejected of the West and what is continued architecturally speaking. This is exactly the point. What is the principle here? The principle is that, think about it. If there's certain amounts of solar radiation, this is the planet, there's solar radiation hitting it on this side, it's very hot. This side, not that much solar radiation because of the tilt of the planet, right? we need to basically respond to that. And the solar radiation and obviously other geological force, forces influence the way in which uh, the fauna and flora of that area, uh, you know, the kind of um, movements uh, of uh, the, the climate in that area. We need to basically begin to wrap our heads around that. And indigenous, all that means is that you and I are the ones who are quite accustomed in relation to this area with this amount of solar radiation. So people who are, the question is, what do we reject from the West? We reject this homogenization, the idea that everything must be done exactly the same way everywhere. It's not realistic, you know? It's like wanting to wear a cap on your bum. You don't wear a cap on your bum because you know, caps are worn on the head. You don't wear it on your bum. So why would you want to put something on the planet that just doesn't fit there? You know what I'm saying? So what needs to go from a Western point of view is this things being just the same everywhere and we need to be 
much more sensitive to the fact that, yes, it's one global system connected to one universal cosmic system. Right. Um, you know, it's so, yes, it's global, but there are very specific ways in which it works in the different uh, niches. Dr. Mape, uh, I, I love the, the insight that you had, um, and I, I love the, <laughs> your approach, I love your energy, I love everything that you've done and everything that you've mentioned, because I feel as though it is moving toward an alternate reality. It's not this one where we all believe everything is singular and everything is either this way or the highway, but it acknowledges that there is lots of ways to a common goal, and there is a, there's something deeply humane about that um, mm. and that acknowledgement. So, Dr. Mape, I think just as you mentioned at the beginning, this ritual, this process where you've taken someone through um, the ideas that they had in the past and it's almost broken down to reframe something new and something of greater strength. I think during this conversation, you've done exactly that because you've taken us through this journey to make us realize that the humanity um, or humanity's view of progress needs to, needs to change. I don't think yeah. that it's the way that we've had it before was sufficient. And even this new view that we're having, it might not be sufficient either, but at least it's a step closer in trying to attempt to get closer to those rhythms and those, those cosmic movements, celestial orbits that you mentioned. And actually, now that I'm also mentioning that that is where the world is heading, even literally and physically, as with Jeff Bezos and the rest of everyone going up to exactly. the sky, trying to figure <laughs> things out from a different perspective. Um, so Dr. Dr. Mafia, thank you very much for your time. I think we're going to take a very short break, uh, but I must thank you again very much for, for your insight and your, your, um, your views and sharing that with us. Um, I know it's taken a long, everything you've mentioned is not as though you just developed this overnight. It's, it's been an experience and you have to research and you have to undergo struggles and difficulties. And I thank you for doing that and, and for sharing your, your insights uh, with the world. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mafia.